The more recent versions of Blazor support something called server-side rendering. We're kind of curious how that works, so let's mash on that. Hi everybody, and welcome to another episode of the ASP Net Monsters. In today's episode, we are going to dig in a little bit on uh, server-side Blazor components. So those those have another name now, aren't they? It's something really weird like Yeah, so in as part of .NET Core 3, or ASP.NET Core 3, this will be shipping as something called Razor Components. So it'll be like okay. part of the ASP.NET framework. Um, I, I don't have the .NET Core 3 preview installed, so looking at this, I was just going to look at it as a Blazor project. And it's this guy here, the server side in ASP.NET Core, mm -hmm. where all of the, the Blazor application itself runs server side. So we've looked at this before, where, uh, where we've looked at Blazor before, but everything was running in the browser, where it was running under the, the mono runtime that's compiled in WebAssembly, and it all runs in, within the context of the browser. So this version of Blazor, which as you mentioned, will be called Razor Components, in the, the near future, if you're looking at preview bits, works a little bit differently. Um, I believe the way it's configured is down in the, is it in startup? I guess it's part of the program here where it's saying Blazor WebAssembly. Oh wait, that's, did I already go down the wrong path here? WebAssembly host would imply to me that it's running on the client side. Oh, okay, so the server right here. So we configure services called the server-side Blazor, and that's where it's uh, it's telling all this stuff to run server-side. All right. Let's just run this first and see what it looks like. It should look just like the client-side Blazor that we looked at. It's just the rendering is going to happen somewhere else. Uh-oh. Oh, already it doesn't work. Package dependencies that did not resolve. We are not off to a good start here, Simon. <laughs> Sometimes. Um, just do like a package update, maybe just have a slightly stale version of this, although this is like 0 0.7, right? I think so. Let's just double check. Uh, go like this. Yep. Yeah, it's point seven. Hmm. Okay. Um, I suppose I could check my extension and just make sure that I'm not out of date there. I don't know that that second would be... from the top. I think there it is. Thank you. Yeah, I don't know that the extension actually really does anything other than provide uh, the template. That's, yeah, and the the language the, services. Yeah. For the, but yeah, that looks like it's not the problem. Right. So let's just do a not that I expect that to do anything different. Huh. Okay, so it looks like Razor Design is just a little bit newer than we wanted it to be. Okay. So just, we can turn that back to zero and see what happens. Unusual that it worked like that. Okay. Uh, so that did get rid of the, the warning, but I've got a couple of errors here. Um, there is something about this that isn't quite right. Well, it did offer to resolve that for you, so you could just do that. What is the difference to that shared? Okay, so this this looks to me like it's a, a bug in the template. If you scroll down, there's no shared project in here, right? No, there isn't. Right, so because the, the shared project only exists um, with client side razor. Yeah. Like in the client side razor template. Yeah. Because it doesn't make it doesn't make any sense to have this shared because there should be no Blazor code running on the, the front end here. Correct. Okay, let's see if 
resolved everything. It's doing something. There we go. Okay, that looks like it works. So the app is running. Oh, since this is running, supposed to be running server side, I should be able to do things like go into my uh, pages here and set a breakpoint, and it should hit that breakpoint. When I click it, there we go. That's a good set. So that's all running server side, and my understanding of how this is supposed to work now is that uh, there's an event that happens here client side when we click the, H the button in, in the browser, and that is supposed to send some kind of message over to the server. Mm -hmm. The server interprets that and updates its representation of the DOM, and then uh, figures out what the result in HTML should look like and sends that back over to the client, uh, and that's, that communication is supposed to be done through SignalR. So I haven't looked at this yet, uh, but I'm, I'm really curious about how that uh, communication happens and what the overhead of that communication might be. Cool, well, let's find ourselves some dev tools. Then. So the first thing I would do is open up my network tab here and uh, how do I dock this thing so that it stays visible like this. So here's my network tab and when I click this, Okay, the message goes to the server, uh, but I'm not seeing anything there. Right. So it's not just an HTTP call, like it's not a or an XHR or anything. I yeah, guess, it should be a web socket, I think. Oh, right. So where can we see those? Can we at all? Uh, so there is a WS tab, but I suspect that it's not uh, showing anything because you need to. It, you didn't have this open when the web socket was established. Uh, so if I hit so refresh, we reload the whole thing. I'll do a hard reload just to make sure. Okay. okay. So that's interesting even just from, okay, yeah, so there's my WebSocket. Um, but also the, if we look at all of the messages that came down, uh, just to see how different that is from when we're running client side, it didn't download the assemblies here, right? Right. So all it did was uh, it downloaded the HTML, which would have had everything already rendered and then our CSS and the JavaScript that it needs to basically talk to uh, the Blazor endpoint over on the server. So that Blazor, is, that Blazor JavaScript is not huge, but it's like 50 kilobytes is still pretty significant. Yeah. So that's, not, that's a compressed size too. Yeah, so it's 151 uncompressed. That's, so if you, if you click into that, is that minified? Uh, it doesn't look like it. Yeah, it oh, is. Oh, it is a little bit, okay. Yeah. So there's a few different packages it looks like they've in, that are included in that. So it's buffer module, some text encoding. Interesting. Okay. Which is probably some signal R stuff, I would suspect, is what what's getting bundled into there. Whatever they're using to make that magic happen. And then the blazer boot.json, which Actually, a little bit surprised that it needs to download that. It's information about the entry point of the app and all the assemblies that it needs. Which the client shouldn't need to know. And then it negotiating the signal R connection, I suppose, is what that would be. Yeah, it looks like it. So it's got a list of kind of like supported transfer formats. So now we should see some WebSocket traffic here if I click. Is that right? That's yeah, you would so. expect. Yeah, but you want you to click over into frames for it. Sorry, like click so what? Uh, so if you go into that and then you click on, like if you click on the, the actual link itself. Yeah, sorry, uh, and then go to the frames tab. Gotcha. I think that might show you the frames as they go down. Or oh, not. Hmm. Oh. oh, just there they are. Yeah, it's okay. Okay, so there's the messages going. Right. So part of the problem here is that these are binary frames. Hmm. Now they're heading back and forth. So the the content of Signal R has changed. It used to be in like pre-core versions of Signal R, 
that it was just sent JSON back and forth. But now it is using a format called message pack, okay. um, which we can link to in the show notes. And I don't know of any way of displaying that inside the browser. Hmm. That's too bad. I was hoping we could see a little bit more about what was happening here, but we can see the length of the message at least. Right. Um, so it gives us some indication of maybe the, the overhead involved. Um, that didn't seem too bad. I so when I click, seemed... there's I oh, four messages. Looks like maybe there's some uh, constant like chatter as well. So 88, 145, 26. Um, what are these, bytes? Yeah, I would think so. Pretty small, but then again, there's not a lot going on here. So the message would just be that the this element was clicked and then presumably the piece it sends back would only be the, the part of the DOM that needs to update, which is just that number there. So mm -hmm. we would expect it to be fairly small. If we do something like navigate to a new page, yeah, then the, oh, yeah, it's much the message is a little bigger, which you would expect because it's a bigger section of the DOM that's updating. Um, I guess that's about all we can really see about it, though. The, the latency in this case, because everything's running locally, is negligible because everything's just on this machine, so it's pretty fast. Um, if we were running this in a more of a distributed fashion like you would normally on a web app, it, there would be some delay there between your button click and then getting mm -hmm. the results back. Uh, yeah, so this stuff must require some degree of server affinity. Yeah, I would think so. It's, but then I, my feeling is that the new version of Signal R requires that anyway. Oh? Like, I don't think that, because it used to be that Signal Art did a whole bunch of pretty smart stuff with a backplane, distributing messages back and forth. Um, and I don't think it does that anymore. I think that was taken out in favor of just having, uh, having server affinity. There is an application cookie here that presumably it needs to identify the user. Um, at least I assume that's probably how it's doing it. Uh, well, I guess we don't know the, the format of these. I suppose that uh, SignalR itself has some concept of the session with that user, right? That's what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, it does. But I, my only question around this stuff is, like, something is maintaining. Like, either we're shipping the entire DOM back and forth each time, or the server is maintaining some sort of idea of what the DOM looks like. Mm -hmm. Based on the size of these messages, I suspect that we aren't shipping the whole DOM every time. No, I don't think so. So yeah, I, I, my understanding or my my gut feeling on that would be that, yeah, the, the server has some representation of that user's uh, current state of the DOM. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm curious about that. Like if we go to that counter and we make some just changes in the browser itself oh. to it. And then like, like if we change the number for sure, it's going to change it. It'll change it back, I would think. Right. But then let's, what if we inserted something around that? Like if you put in a prefix before the, the paragraph tag? So it updates that just fine. So it knows it's specifically that that element that needs to update. 
Yeah, what happens if you delete it? And then it's clear. <laughs> Can't uh, find it's, it. It's a, yeah, so far it doesn't update that. Interesting. There's no errors or anything indicating that it can't. Right, so I mean that kind of proves that it's not doing DOM shipping, because if mm -hmm. it was shipping the DOM back and forth, then the changes server side would probably put that back in there. Curious if I put it back, if it's going to figure it out. Yeah. It had some reference to that specific element, even though it doesn't didn't have an ID or anything. Yeah, I wonder how it does that. Hmm. That would require some digging into the code, for Blazor to figure out. But beyond the scope, I think of what we're going to do for this video. Mm -hmm. All yeah. right, so I think we we answered the question of like, is it fairly efficient in terms of network traffic? And it looks like it is. Yeah, like, it seems to be. We, we're using WebSockets. We're not shipping a whole lot of data each time. Um, the question of how efficient is it on, in terms of server-side memory, I don't think has been answered. Uh, that would, no. We'd have to either fire a bunch of browsers at it or create a very large DOM and just see if the, the memory size changes. Yeah. So we might uh, might follow up with a video where we, we set up a more complex scenario to, to kind of test that out and see. Mm -hmm. But as it stands, it seems okay. Yeah, it's uh, it definitely seems like a it's efficient um, in terms of the messages that are going back and forth. And there isn't too much chatter. It's uh, I mean, there's chatter there in the sense that every time you you click on something that has an event tied to it, it has to go back and forth. But it doesn't seem too too bad. Mm -hmm. But the fact that like removing that paragraph tag and putting it back in, that that implies to me that oh, oh wow. <laughs> oh, okay, so that's interesting because it looks like it's having that prefix there has completely messed up its yeah. standing of the DOM. That's so interesting. That, that definitely means to me that like if you're gonna do this, then you sort of can't mix anything in with it. Yeah, you have to leave the you can't have some client-side JavaScript that's also manipulating things other than just through that uh, interaction with the server-side component. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. It might be hard for people to kind of wrap their heads around that one. Yeah, I, I would hope that there would be kind of like a concept of like an ignore tag that you could say like the content of this div don't worry about trying to change it or update it or anything like that. Just ignore it and assume that the content there is correct to allow you to use things like client-side applications or client-side libraries like D3 or something like that. Mm -hmm. But you wouldn't be able to mix like Blazor and uh, Telerik client side control or something like that. No, I don't that, think that doesn't seem like it would work. Well I think that today we've just come up with more questions than answers. We have indeed. Good stuff. We'll just continue <laughs> to dig into it another time then. Alright. Sounds good. Well, thanks Simon. Thank you and thanks everybody for joining us today on this episode. Remember to I don't know if to like, comment and share like the YouTube trifecta of things that we demand. Uh, and we'll see everybody on the next episode. Bye.